generation. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. I gotta tell you, it's one of the stranger things. I got some messages on Facebook from people saying they were singing along in the shower to the theme of extreme jeans. And, and somebody else said, Yeah, me too. It's like, really? I'm glad to know it's catchy. Hey, it's Extreme Jeans, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeJeans.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree. And watch the nuts fall out. And this segment of the show is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. First of all, before we go anywhere, we want to welcome a new radio station to our long list of radio affiliates across the nation. K-A-T-O, 1230 AM in Safford, Arizona. We're proud to be part of Reed Richen's outstanding weekend lineup. And we know there are going to be some great family history stories to be found in Safford, Arizona. Well, coming up a little bit later on today, we're going to have uh, two great segments with a woman named Christine Pitsley. She is the project manager for a World War I effort, a gathering of material from people's archives and attics and old letters and materials for the Connecticut State Library. And you're going to want to hear what she's doing, how she's doing it, and what materials and stories she's come up with. It's intriguing stuff since this is the 100th anniversary of the end of the war to end all wars. Right now, let's head out to Boston and talk to my good friend David Allen Lamb. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? Hey, I'm not doing too bad. How about yourself, Fish? Uh, you know, I'm just dealing with a little uh, lung gumbu, but we're getting through it. Well, do me a favor. If you're going to have any major problems, please don't visit the village of Longyearbyen in Norway because it's illegal to die there. What? <laughs> yeah, apparently because of the very cold temperatures, bodies don't decompose all the way. And there were a few people that had died during the Spanish flu back in 1918. So if you accidentally disturb the earth nearby, you might release the bacteria, which was responsible for killing over 100 million people worldwide. Ooh. So this village does not want you to die there. So if you're dying, you must leave. And you're obviously not going to be buried there. <laughs> so for genealogy, that are looking for those fresh DNA samples of ancestors, if you're Norwegian and have roots from there, you may be able to get something from your great, great, great <laughs> grandparents. Because they're still there. Literally. We all have those family trees that kind of come together occasionally. You know, when our ancestors married their own first cousins. Yep. Doubling up of ancestors, it happens to everybody. Sure. A great story from the New York Times in regard to genie.com. And one of the things that they talk about is when people stop marrying their first cousins, and it's actually when mobility started going forward. So yeah. in 1825 to 1875, you've got people that are moving west, more opportunity. You're not in the same town or village. Populist doesn't say, well, the cousin is kind of cute. Why don't we get married? I have third great-grandparents who are first cousins. But as far as I know, my great-great-grandmother only had ten fingers and toes, two <laughs> eyes and a nose. Well, and, and <laughs> You know, to that point, actually, in all seriousness, there are studies that show that there really aren't dramatic increases in risk of birth defects or anything if you were to marry a first cousin. That's and very true. It, it, siblings is a different story, obviously. But first cousin marriage, very common. Like you mentioned, I had the same thing happen. My third great grandfather's parents were first cousins, which actually made him his own second cousin. <laughs> Makes me want to sing the song, I'm my own grandpa. Exactly. Well, my next story is roaming through the subways in Rome. Rome is building a new subway system, and they have found sometimes as many as 14 rooms from buildings from 271 A.D. And every time they build a new station, well, they have to stop so the archaeologists can get in there and find some amazing treasures. Incredible. And wasn't one of the rooms heated? Wasn't there some evidence of that? Yeah, one of the rooms is actually heated. <laughs> so it's, it's possible that this may have been high-end property. Sure. Sure. Last week, we talked about Paul Allen from Microsoft, one of the founders, who has been responsible for finding the USS Indianapolis, the USS Lexington last week, and many of you may have heard of the Fighting Sullivans, the five brothers who died on the USS Juno back in 1942. Yeah, they just found the Juno. 
Oh, which is amazing. That is so, incredible. So this guy's found the Lexington, the Indianapolis, the Juno, and who knows what else. He, he also found the ward from Pearl Harbor. Wow. I mean, what a, yeah. what a legacy Paul Allen is creating himself, using his billions for really good stuff. He really is, and I think that it's fascinating that we can see the images for a vessel that has not seen the light of day in 75 years. That's right. So for the descendants of people that were on the Juno, because there were more than just the five Sullivan brothers, there were actually 687 people perished. Going to Harvard University, the laboratory run by David Reich has had a fascinating run recently. They've actually extracted the DNA from 900 people, 900 ancient people. Really? Including a 2,500-year-old sample from Britain, a Bronze Age person from Russia, and some samples from Arabia. So these bone fragments are being extracted, the DNA. So of these 900 people, one of our listeners could have their ancestor out there. Maybe more than one of us, you know, when you think of it (laughs) from that far back, maybe all of us. Correct. It's nice to know that my ancestor may be just right across the river (laughs) uh, at Harvard University being studied this very moment. Yes. Well, my blogger spotlight this week goes out to a good friend of ours, Blaine Bettinger, who has been on the radio show before. Blaine is an author and is the genetic genealogist, and his website by the same name, thegeneticgenealogist.com, has his insight and discoveries in his own research, as well as overall news from the field. I always like to hear his lectures and also like to read his blog. Hopefully you will, too. That's about all I have from Beantown. But before I leave, I do want to mention that if you're not a member of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, we've been around since 1845. We'd love to have you as one of our members. And because you're a listener of Extreme Genes, mention the code EXTREME on your checkout as a coupon code and save $20. Well, that's about all I have here. Got to run and get a snow shovel out here because we're going to get some weather in Boston (laughs) once again. All right, David. Great to talk to you. As always, we'll catch up with you again next week. Talk to you soon, my friend. And coming up next, we're going to be talking to Christine Pitsley. She is a World War I project manager for the Connecticut State Library. She has asked people to dig into their attics and see what they've got on their World War I ancestor as we celebrate the century mark on the end of the war to end all wars. That's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. 
Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Jeans, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Jeans Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Jeans Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Jeans rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on extremejeans.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well known family history experts. Catch visits with Genie stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Genes. You know, for those of us who have been around for a while and many years ago may have actually known a World War I vet or two, it's hard to imagine that it is this year. It's been 100 years since the end of World War I. Hi, it's Fisher. This is Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. And this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com genealogists. And I'm really excited to have Christine Pitsley on the line with us right now. She is the project director for a World War I project going on at the Connecticut State Library in Hartford, Connecticut right now. Hi, Christine. Welcome to Extreme Genes. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Tell us about this project and how you got into it, how you became the project director, and what you've learned from it. So back in 2014, our former state archivist asked the state librarian and myself what we could do with this incredible collection of glass plate negatives we had from World War I. So we started looking at it and started kind of coming up with this plan on how we could digitize those and maybe see what people in the state had in their attics and yes. closets. So we held a few pilot projects in the fall of 2014 where we invited members of the public to bring us their World War I stuff. And that was photos and uniform items. And that first event we had, someone brought a grenade. Oh. And we, no, wait, we wait, could, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it was an empty grenade. Okay, all right. But for some of the folks, you know, sitting around that didn't know that, <laughs> um, eyes went a little bit wide. And uh, we kind of put the kibosh on bringing any weapons right, after right. that. Right, right. Good call. Um, so we asked these folks to bring us what they have. And... We would sit down with them. We would record the stories about their parents or their grandparents, and then we'd scan everything that they brought in, or as much as we could. Right, or photograph and it, it. Yeah, and then we would give it back to them. That's so incredible. They, so this went on for how long, and what year was this? That was fall of 2014, okay. and we are still going. We've held over 40 events now all over the state of Connecticut in museums and libraries and American Legion halls and community centers. We've collected somewhere between four and 500 individual stories of soldiers and sailors and nurses from all over the world. We've got Italian soldiers and British. We had a Slovakian Red Cross worker, you name it, then soldiers from all over the country as well. With all of those people, I think we've probably got somewhere upwards of 5,000 images at this point. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. From back in the day. And you're digitizing these things. Is this a state-funded thing? We are actually funded this year through a grant from the National Endowment of Humanities. Uh, it's a common heritage grant okay. that allowed us to do about 20 of these events. And that funding allowed me to hire staff. The first two years we did this, it was all volunteer-based, so all of the people that came and worked at these events were volunteers. This year and last year, it's all been um, funded. So we've hired students and veterans to come and work at these events, to do the interviewing, to do the scanning, and I have a great staff at this point. They know what they're doing, and I can rely on them to you know, help me get things done when things get really busy. Sure. Wow. So what are some of the best stories you've heard from this thing? So one of my favorites, a gentleman came into an event in Wilton, and he had a ton of stuff, photos and uh, some maps, and this tiny little thing. It was maybe an inch and a half, two inches long, and it was just a little cylinder. 
I had never seen something like this before. It was the cylinder that would be attached to a carrier pigeon's leg. And some of those maps were these tiny little maps that were folded up inside of the cylinder. And wow. somehow, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it, it weighs all of an ounce. And somehow this has survived for 100 years. So this is this, something that they use basically to communicate uh, positions of the enemy or, or, or wherever they are stationed themselves, right? Getting yeah. that information back. And so this guy's ancestor was involved with these pigeons? Yeah, his father was in charge of the pigeons. And he told us the story how his father needed to be a sharpshooter. Because if the pigeon started flying in the wrong direction, you'd have to be able to shoot it down. Right, because uh, you don't want the enemy to get your positions that are on the map. Yeah. So he, he also said, thankfully, his father never had to shoot any of the pigeons down. But, you know, that was one of those things that you don't really think about. Sure. So that's one of my favorites. Isn't that um, interesting? Because World War I, to me, seems within reach, right? The Civil War doesn't anymore. And yet, with a war like World War I that was in reach, yet you're still communicating with carrier pigeons. I mean, it yeah. seems just so ancient. Yep. Well, when I talk to students, you know, I always ask, how do you think you got your news back then? And I've had students answer, oh, television. Well, no, there was no television. <laughs> well, movie reels. Well, there really weren't movie no. reels, per se. So then they go to radio. Well, radio really didn't exist no. either. 1920s. Uh, it, yeah, radio was a military tool at that point. So communications in the trenches were by runners, guys literally running back and forth carrying messages or these carrier pigeons. So it's a world away, but like you said, many of us growing up knew World War I vets. Yeah, that's um, right. So the stories are still very alive for a lot of the folks that we have come into our project. I'll bet. Now, I grew up in Connecticut, and I had a neighbor whose name was Douglas Campbell, and he was America's first flying ace in World War I, flew alongside Eddie Rickenbacker, and actually he had uh, kids late, so they were my age, my kid brother's age as well, and we used to play with them, and my dad, because he was a recreational pilot, had a nice relationship with this man, and it was just an amazing thing to know him at the time. I think he passed about 25 years ago. But I would imagine his stories would fit in well with your project. They do. And believe it or not, when we did an event earlier this year in Greenwich at the Bruce Museum, his widow came in with some of her children and, you know, came to remember his service. Wow. I had no yeah. idea she was still around. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, she's in her 90s. They were very, she was very young when they married. I think she was 20 and he was 59, mm -hmm. uh, hence why the kids are, are yep. older. And when someone said that there was a widow of a World War I vet, I kind of shook my head and said, no, they must be mistaken. She must be a World War II <laughs> veteran's widow. Nope, she was World War I veteran's widow. Well, and then that happened a lot with the Civil War people. I think there may be a widow from the Civil War or two still out there right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's uh, incredible. I know it. You read about those things, and they're still getting a veteran's pension quite often. I know there are a couple of daughters of Civil War vets, you know, born in the 1920s to old, old veterans who are still getting some money. So this is incredible. Where do you see this going, and is this something happening in other states as well? Are you coordinating with other people? You know, we did an event a couple weekends ago in Rhode Island with the Rhode Island World War I Centennial Commission, and we worked with the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago. So we ran the event. We had a great turnout. People all over New England came. So it was a really nice test to see if our model would work elsewhere. We'll be continuing our events here in the state throughout the rest of the year, and we're going to try and get everything up online as soon as possible. I would like to see this continue because there's a lot of stuff still out there yeah. and we are still getting requests for more events this year and there's only so much time left. I would really like to see it kind of expand as well into a larger veterans memory project where we're talking to World War II vets. And that's one of the questions I get asked at every event I do is, when are you doing this for World War II? My dad is still alive, and he fought in World War II. You know, when can right. he come and tell we his story? We still have them. That's right. Yeah. I, I think about how incredible this would be if we still had World War I vets to talk to. And I, I don't want to miss the opportunity. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if I don't do it, I'd love someone to <laughs> someone do this. Someone to on step it. up. Well, I love the idea of what you're doing, asking people to come forward. And we've talked about this on Extreme Genes a lot lately, using the hashtag archive in the attic and getting people to participate by sharing with us stories of things they found that they didn't even know they had. And that's a lot of this. We try and do a public program a week or two weeks before one of these digitization days so that we can let people know what we're doing. And time after time, we have people come back and say, you know, after your presentation or after this event, I went home and look at all this stuff I found. Or I called my mother and look at all this stuff I found. Um, We do have a way for people to submit things online if you're out of state. We can only collect things from Connecticut if you live in Connecticut or if you have a Connecticut soldier. But if you're elsewhere in the country and you have a Connecticut soldier in your background and you've got photos, you can submit them to our project online. We have a whole form and mechanism to help you do that. All right. And, you know, you mentioned that I wound up with a collection of letters written by my dad's second cousin that came in a whole bunch of family history stuff I obtained in 2014. Letters from the trenches in France. And this guy talked about the experience over there. And when the war was over, they weren't able to get them back home real fast. And so they're just basically on leave for five months or something, waiting for when the boats are going to come take them back and they can get back to their lives. It was an amazing thing. Yeah, it was. For these boys, it was an experience because, you know, a lot of them had never left the small towns that they came from. Right. And here they were going to, you know, a foreign country where a different language was spoken. And it was an experience of a lifetime for so many of these men and women. Now, one of those stories did come out of Connecticut that I guess they're making a movie out of here. Yes. Something about a dog. Now, you want to just give us the background and then we'll get to the full story after the break. Sergeant Stubby, as he's known today, is the most decorated war dog in American military history. (laughs) And he has a story that seems like it came out of Hollywood. We're going to talk more about Sergeant Stubby the dog and what's becoming of his tale, well, of his story, (laughs) coming up next in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, 
Hey, we're back. It is Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And we're talking the Great War today, World War I. It's the 100th anniversary of the conclusion of the war to end all wars. And Christine Pitsley is on the phone with me right now from the Connecticut State Library. She's the project director for a World War I commemoration that has gathered all kinds of material from people's attics. This is what we talk about on the show look and find what you've got and write about it and hashtag it archive in the attic and let people know that maybe they can find some things like you're finding in their attic or in their basement it doesn't matter but christine was just telling us before the break about a story of a dog and this is a connecticut dog that was uh what was it on the loose christine this was uh, not owned by anybody it was just kind of a, a renegade dog he was he was just a stray roaming the streets of new haven and some man adopted him and took him along to World War I. Yes. He was adopted the summer of 1917 by a New Britain soldier named uh, Robert Conroy. Okay. And he apparently was smuggled on board the ship <laughs> when they left in September of 17. He was smuggled aboard. Under, now, 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 wait uh, a minute. Was, was he uh, drafted or did he volunteer, Robert? Conroy? Yeah. Conroy volunteered. Okay. He had volunteered, I think it was April or May of 17, so not long after war was officially declared. And they were camped out at Yale Field, which is right by the Yale Bowl, yep. for about two months. And, yeah, Stubby kind of wandered into camp, and Conroy fell in love. So they smuggled him on board. They wrapped him up in a coat, in one of their field coats, and got him on board and taught him how to salute. And there's a story that <laughs> that one of the officers found him on board and Stubby saluted and, you know, just kind of melted the officer's oh, yeah. heart. He finished the journey with him to France. By that point, he had really become the mascot of Connecticut's 102nd Infantry, which sure. were the Connecticut contingent of the 26th Yankee Division. Right. Now, a lot, a lot of divisions had mascots, did they not? But not necessarily a living creature. Um. You'd be surprised at how many of these divisions and, and regiments had their own mascots. Dogs. Really? Um, there's a story of a lion. One no. regiment had a lion. Yep. Company K, which was a Hartford regiment, had a goat that they called <laughs> Mademoiselle Fanny. Uh, but Stubby was really the mascot that stuck. You know, he was this lovable dog. He was a bull terrier, Staffordshire terrier kind of mutt. And he was incredibly intelligent. He was gassed, and Ooh. that gas allowed him to kind of sense the gas before it came. Okay. So he would run along the trenches, alerting the soldiers to incoming gas attacks before the gas alarms even went off. You've got to be kidding me. That's no. incredible. He's credited with saving uh, one soldier, Sergeant John Curtin's life, from this gas attack. There's also a story that he was able to distinguish German soldiers from American soldiers. <laughs> really? Yeah. He knew and the uniforms. He either knew the uniforms or he knew the sound of the, the language, something. Okay. There's a story that there was a German officer or German soldier in the American camps, and Stubby found him and kind of grabbed hold of his butt and held on until American soldiers came and captured this German spy. That's incredible. Yeah. And he did a lot of things like that. He really earned his place as a hero. Well, and it sounds like it. It sounds like no other animal I've ever heard in the war situation. And the thing is, you know, it almost sounds like a Hollywood story, mm -hmm. uh, something that Hollywood made up, this amazing dog who also became kind of the original therapy dog. He would go to the American Red Cross hospitals over there and kind of cheer soldiers up. And so he became a therapy dog, though they didn't call it that sure. at the time. Of course. And did he survive the war? He did. He came home and was given a hero's parade here in Hartford. No kidding. So they, the stories were out there about him. I think it was more verbal stories. Okay. And then by the time they came home in 1919, he was hitting the newspaper, and he was very well known. He did some vaudeville shows at Poli Theater in New Haven and Hartford. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't know exactly what he did yet on the stage, but he is billed in these Poli's vaudeville shows. 
That's incredible. He, yeah, he went on to become a lifetime member of the Eddie Glover Post of the American Legion in New Britain. The American <laughs> Red Cross gave him a lifetime membership, as did the Hartford YMCA. He met three different presidents. General John J. Pershing personally decorated him. Wow. Yeah. There was a story that he saved the village of Chateau Thierry. Now, by, how, did, how did he do that? He, by alerting them to an incoming attack. So the women of Chateau Thierry made him a blanket. It's a chamois blanket that they sewed patches onto, and he has a blanket full of medals. That's incredible. Has that uh, blanket survived? It has. It's not in great shape, and it is at the Smithsonian Museum of American History, along with Stubby. Stubby died in Conroy's arms in 1926, and Conroy worked with the museum to preserve him. So Stubby is currently on permanent display in the Price of Freedom Gallery. The blanket is out for conservation. It's mm -hmm. too fragile to be displayed at this point. Sure. But it's still there. That's incredible. Now, you were telling me during the break here, we got a movie coming out about Stubby the dog, Sergeant Stubby? Yes. It's called Sergeant Stubby, an American Hero. It's being produced by Fun Academy Motion Pictures, which is a group out of Columbus, Georgia. And it's an animated film. So we're really excited because we're going to be hosting one of the premieres here in New Haven just two blocks from the New Haven Green where some of these troops camped and trained. Right. On streets that Stubby once roamed. <laughs> it's slated to open in over 3,000 theaters on April 13th. The film stars Logan Lerman as Robert Conroy. Helena Bonham Carter plays his sister, who is the narrator of the film. And Gerard Depardieu plays one of the French soldiers. Oh, that they wow. So we're not talking an indie house kind of film. This no. is national release. Right. The trailers are in the theaters. I have been hearing reports that they are also on television now. And we're really excited because we have been working with the studio for over a year. And we've provided a lot of background material for them. And, you know, we're working with them on the premiere. You know, it's exciting to have this Connecticut story come to life on the big screen, animated. I'm looking forward to it. When did you say it's coming out again? April 13th. So it's it's right upon us. Fantastic. It is. <laughs> it is. Well, this sounds like an amazing project you're involved with. Kind of a life-changing thing for you, I would imagine. It is. I'm excited. I get to leave for France the day after the film comes out to follow in the footsteps of... Connecticut soldiers, and I will be visiting the places where a lot of the folks who have come in and taken part in our project, I'll be visiting the places that their fathers and grandfathers photographed, and visiting the graves of the men who didn't come home. And we've got one woman who really never knew anything about her uncle. All she knew was that he died in the war. So on her behalf, I'll be photographing his grave in, in France. It's going to be a really humbling, life-changing trip for me. But it's going to be fun, too, because I get to take a plush Sergeant Stubby with me. And <laughs> we will be following in his footsteps. And right. people can follow our journey on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Unbelievable. She's Christine Pitsley. She's the Connecticut State Library Project Director for the World War I commemoration on the 100th anniversary of the end of the war to end all wars. Christine, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me on. This was great. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Tom Perry, our preservation authority on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Jeannie's my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night, has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Did you know that FamilySearch Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And it's time once again to talk preservation with my good friend Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. How are you, Tom? Super. And as always, we're getting uh, lots of questions about preservation. I was really intrigued by this one from Patty Vital. She said, help. Yesterday, I was going through boxes of old photos while visiting my dad, and we found this plastic bag full of my great uncle's photos from World War II, just thrown in a plastic bag and sitting in the bottom of a box, and every photo is curled. However, Uncle Dom took the time to write on the back of most of the photos to identify who's in the pictures. Last night, I looked up a couple of the guys on Fold 3, what a great thing to do, Patty, and then found them in family trees on Ancestry.com and emailed the tree owners to see if they'd be interested in seeing the pics. So clearly I need to digitize these as soon as possible. Is there anything that can be done or should be done about the curling? And some of the photos are faded. Can anything be done about restoring those? And included in this pile are some of the original negatives. A lot of pieces to this question. What do I do with those? Some look really faded and not useful, but some negatives are clear and seem well-preserved. Best patty. What say you, Tom? Okay, this is awesome. This is a gold mine. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. This is great. What I would suggest, and she has some negatives, is the first thing you want to do is if you have like a photo studio in your area, take all the negatives over to them and see if they can make what's called a contact print. What they do is they just make a small photo of each one so you can see which ones are clear, which ones aren't. And then you can go through and figure out, okay, we've got a negative of this one that looks good. We've got a negative of this one that looks good. Because if you can find all the same photos that are the good quality ones, the ones that you want, you just want to take those negatives and scan those instead of going to the expense of scanning the photo and then having to restore the photo. So if your negatives are in good condition, that's what you want to do. Or if you've got a home negative scanner, of course, you can just scan them yourself. 
But the first thing I would do is find out where they match up. And then if you have any photos that aren't in negatives, then you'll definitely want to scan those. I would not worry about the curling because a lot of times when you have curling, you have to go through the distilled water batch and make them flat and all this kind of stuff. But if they're just basically curling right now, you can also get away with putting them on a flat bit scanner and scanning both sides of them because the weight of the scanner itself will kind of pretty much flatten out the photo, so that way you can scan them together. Would that cause any cracking, Tom, to do that? Well, it shouldn't. It depends how badly they are curled. Because the thing is, if you're going to have problems and they are going to crack, they're going to crack no matter what you do. Sure. I would go with that first. That would be my first solution versus going through and going through the wetting stage and maybe damaging or somehow the emulsion on them. Now, what about the process that I've gone through with some materials that were wrinkled or whatever, where it relaxed the paper? I think it was more of a steam process. Could that work? Oh, yeah. A lot of people do that. You want to be really, really careful. Keep it so the steam is really, really low because you don't want to burn your picture just like you'd burn your hand. So that's a process, too. But if this is your first experiment, I wouldn't suggest any of those kind of things unless you have some pictures there that are curled also that are like a scenery, the stuff you don't care about then go and mess around with those because then if you damage them, it's not going to be any big deal. But always practice on the reels that aren't important. Just like we tell people when they do film, if you want to watch some of your old film that you don't want to go through the steps, find something that's not important and check out that first. So if you damage, it's no big deal. And make sure when you scan them, you scan the front, then the back, so then when you have your digital files, you'll know for sure which information went with which photo. So if you go through and do all the fronts and all the backs, you're going to drive yourself nuts figuring out which one went with which. Boy, that makes a lot of sense. All right, there's a lot of pieces to this question, and we're going to dig into it just a little bit more as we come back when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmasters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. We 
are back for our final segment of Extreme Genes for this week, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. And you know you've been listening to this segment for a long time. I hope you're paying attention and rescuing a lot of the photos. And we're kind of dissecting this question we got, Tom, from Patty Vital, asking about this old box of her great uncle's photos from World War II and negatives. And the pictures were curled and they're, and they're fading. We were talking about the curling thing before the break and then during the break we were kicking around this concept of taking them perhaps to a craft store where they do this relaxing process professionally and then mount them on foam core which I've done several times it's fantastic it makes them perfectly flat and frameable except it is a little bit thick when you put it on the foam core right and there's a lot of different options like we were talking off the air if you want to do something like some shadow boxes or you want to do some frames that maybe don't have glass on the front of them, that they are three-dimensional and put some really neat colors behind them, or some other photos have kind of gone along that era, it can make them really, really cool. So it kind of depends on what your end goal is, which we talk about all the time. If you want to make some works of art, I would definitely recommend that. Go the relaxing way, put them on foam core. If you want just something a little bit simpler, you want just standard frames, nothing fancy, then go the way and scan your negatives first to see which ones you have, and then other ones that you don't have, then go and do the photos. But just, again, make sure you do them back-to-back so you know where the information is from one photo to another photo, and then go in and frame them. And sometimes you can actually type up a little teeny piece of paper that has the information written on the back, and you can transcribe that in a real small, like a two-point font, and put that actually on the front of the picture. So when people are looking at your photo gallery or your photo album, they can actually see the print that was on the back side of them, too, and say, oh, yeah, this was Uncle Ed in World War II. You know, he was a flyer, and he was in this many different airlifts and did these kind of things. It just adds a little bit of personality to it. Or I've even seen it where they do the foam core, where they kind of do that. And then right below that, on another piece of foam core, is where they put the description. You put in a little bit of an oversized frame, and then below that foam core, on a smaller piece of foam core, you put the description, which is on the back. And these look really, really great, especially with the kinds that don't have glass on the front. Right. It actually makes it three-dimensional. looks really sweet. And it also tells the story and gives you context to the picture. The one thing that I would say, though, is sometimes it's actually better to frame your digitized copy because you mentioned that some of these are faded. The only way to really correct the fading is to go in and Photoshop the picture. And you can clean it up and you can make it uh, bigger and do whatever you want with it. The other aspect of framing an original picture is it tends to fade. So if they're already faded, and even if you put it behind UV glass, you might have some problems with that over the long haul. So think about it that way, Patty. Would you agree, Tom? Oh, 100%. That is the absolute truth. I would never take an original photo and put it any place that's going to be exposed to any kind of light. I don't care what kind of UV glass you have. You always want to keep those in a safe spot. Do the prints off of the scans that you do, because if they fade or something happens to them, no big deal. You still have the digital file. Make a new one. But, yeah, never, ever display your original. That's a big no-no. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Patty, great questions. I hope we answered every facet of that, and I'm sure it applies to a lot of other people's thoughts about some of the things they may have uncovered over time. And if you have a question for Tom Perry, it's really easy to reach him. All you have to do is email asktom at tmcplace.com, or you can go to his Twitter page at asktomp. Tom, thanks so much once again, and we'll uh, talk to you again next week. My pleasure. Hey, that's it for this time around. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks also to our guest, Christine Pitsley, who came on from the Connecticut State Library talking about her amazing project to recapture all the histories of the World War I vets in her area and how she's going about it. Hopefully it's something that will be duplicated in other states and cities. And by the way, if you haven't done it yet, sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It is absolutely free. We give you a blog each week and a couple of links to an old and new show and links to stories you'll You'll find of interest as a genealogist. Talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 